morning everybody and welcome to a sunny Welsh day at Powys Castle. So this is a castle um, designed by William Wind. This is at its peak in the 1680s. So uh, if you can see on there, we've got this lovely Dutch water garden, um, etchings taken, the engravings from the top of the cascade. And um, looking across to the terrace, you'll see there's lots of topiary. So all these little balls and different shapes there, some quite intricate or very intricate on the Avery Terrace, going right up to the castle on top of the, just below the castle there, there's about five toperies, so uh, very formal, very laid out, lots of labour intensive uh, topery to look after. But this changed, the landscape movement come along, this castle seen all the changes really, and because it stayed in the same ownership of the family for over 400 years, nothing was swept aside. So uh, elements of every sort of landscape garden movement survives. So this is Paul Sandymon etching. This is when there was actually plans to probably dynamite the terraces, which didn't go ahead due to the terrain and probably the funding, the family were spending more time. It's a shooting lodge, Powers Castle, so they uh, spent the winters here and the summers uh, in London. But if you look, lots of the ewes have been removed, all the topiaries gone, the Dutch water garden went in 1812, and you see the fluffiness, the sort of landscape, uh, these are the yew trees. So the little yew topiaries that were left were allowed to grow into yew trees. And uh, yeah, nice soft landscape movement. So this is, I should probably view it today, looking across from the cascade while we're looking at the engraving, the book engraving. So you can see the use tumps, officially in Wales, we call them tumps, they yew trees. It's a giant topiary or, or yew tumps. So they were allowed to grow into trees, then the Victorians cut them. And so the huge clipped trees, the ones there, so the Victorians cut them and uh, got them back in control. There's 14 of those fellas left, and as you'll see in a minute, some quite large yew hedges to cut. This um, picture is part of the Country Life collection. So that was taken in the early 1900s. It's actually standing in the formal garden. Uh, these trees in front are apple trees, mainly apples, a couple of pears in there. But this is the latest addition to the garden. So Lady Violet was keen to take over the garden from her, her husband, George, and did so in the early 1900s. So this was the site of the kitchen garden. So she removed the kitchen garden. Uh, and you're still on terraces where the nice, long, straight yew hedges. There were some um trees there they blew over in the wind she didn't look like king down on the glass houses so they were moved to the current location these apple trees were planted and create this uh, sort of kitchen garden fit for a viscountess so um they're still going today they're still going there. it's lovely to see well if we look up towards the castle you can see the yew trees they're all uh, great shapes now all nice and tidy clipped but if you look to the castle and just below, look right and then below, that's the big yew hedge and it's been cut right back to the stales. So splitters, we like to call it in the UK. It obviously become overgrown on that side. There's also pathways. So um, cut right back to the stales to regenerate. And that's the current view of it today. So you can see the apple trees are still there. Uh, keep them going as we good as we can. So over 100 years old, still fruiting quite well. But if you look up towards the castle, there's the big hedge. It obviously responded quite nicely. Um, all nice and green, back and growing. And you can just see the cherry picker popping up over the top there and cutting them. So um, that hedge, is probably about the height of three double deckers if you stood them on top of each other so about 14 meters high so uh yeah quite challenging to be fair 
So how on earth do we cut them? Uh, Joke can show you some of the hand tools being used before. So this is a again early shot, early 1900s. There's actually a walking stick on the picture towards the bottom. So the the Earl had a walking stick. So that's a photograph he'd taken, put his stick down there while he took it. The chap stood right on the top with nerves of steel. He's um, probably got a scaffold board stuck on there and he's using a scythe to cut the hedge up there. Also, you can see through the hedge you know, when it was split on the earlier photograph, so you can see the, uh, the daylight through it there. If you look along a bit, you can see the ladders. So you've got a chap there with his handsicle, uh, some on his shears. A great angle on that ladder um, with a brick popped under the right hand corner of it to um, compensate for the slope because there's a slope down further down from that hedge. And uh, another chap is just popping off the top of it. So you got us on that one photograph alone, you got two, four, six gardeners. Uh, we haven't even got six of us working in the garden at the moment. So, uh, so yeah, very, very labour intensive way of cutting this hedge. So when I had to look at it, I had to look at ways we could do it. And obviously you can buy with Elf and Zayde. Maybe that's something we could have tried um, for you guys there with shears and a, a great ladder. Uh, arrangement that's actually not a powis castle that somebody sent me that one in or uh, decided not to go along with that truth you know so we came to this method first of all so one of the lads when he's cutting the hedges um, get your photograph taken probably more than you'd ever do on your wedding day if you're not cutting these edges most commonly asked question in the garden is how on earth do we cut them and uh, they're just mesmerizing to be fair but that's the side that was split you can see it's smooth somebody asked before about the ladies do the hedge cutting if you notice these a lady halfway up the ladder cutting the hedges with a small little wonder hedge cutter they're sort of the old one so you could just add one button on it so you didn't have to use two hands um, if you look down along the ladder you can see there's a couple of ratchet straps they're uh, fastened onto metal pegs, so the ladder's going to stay put. And Ruth follows. Yeah, she's got some, hasn't she really? But she's uh, got a harness on and a rope for the rest system. So uh, if she did slip, she shouldn't go too far. Drop the edge cutter to one side would be probably the best bet. Uh, the interesting bit when you go up on that ladder near that section of hedge, is the bull sticks out. The ladder weighed 85 kilos, treble extending ladder, so uh, quite a challenge pushing it up and bring it down but obviously had the ropes but even still uh, quite a lot of strength to put it up but when you got onto the third section past that board you, one part of that didn't quite touch the hedge so as you walked up the third section of the ladder it, it dropped into the hedge dropped forward into it and uh, did the same as you back down to you go on the second section so uh, a bit of seesawing on a ladder eh? so how do we cut it today? We uh, use cherry pickers. So that's um, part of the hedge on the opposite side of where Ruth was just cutting now. So that's Dan in the cherry picker. He, uh, he's been all over cutting on these, but you can see the clip branches. So you could call it cloud pruning, uh, the living sculptures really. So you'll see uh, all the different shapes. People see all sorts in them and say like looking at clouds. So somebody's told me they've seen Homer Simpson in there but, uh, yeah i sometimes see a lot of work when i look personally but yeah absolutely stunning and uh, mesmerizing really so the challenge was is getting to cut them all by this little cherry picker so that level there is a crane lifting the cherry picker onto the avery terrace the sort of middle terrace where there's there's no access there's only steps up and down so uh, once a year we get a crane in, he lifts it on and we book it in for a week. It sort of leaves it here, that's the most cost effective way of doing it. And it takes about four days, even I can do it in four days. So 
I'm quite proud of that, I suppose. So you go behind the big edge and work back along and you'd have probably looking about three weeks with two people on there. So uh, that's really good to be able to do it off the cherry picker. Obviously a lot safer, but still, as you go up in the height, um, you're going over top of the U's, but you're also on a slope. So we've leveled it up. So in places you could be um, 12 meters or 14 meters high. We've got one cherry picker that comes in now that's 25 meters, but you've also got the drop below you. So um, really got to head for the heights and uh, enjoy the fairgrounds. So with the cherry picker, the last one on the photograph was our own, which um, unfortunately tried to um, dispose of one of my staff. So we, we got rid of that and now we hire machines in. This little one we've actually got in this week with um, pruning in our courtyard and you can see it doesn't have the outriggers on. So you can see on that photograph, the pathways are very narrow and on there, it was very difficult to get the outriggers out. So you were pushing them under the trees and things. So uh, we got a ticket, uh, competence ticket to use the ones on outriggers and also that one. On. And that's a little beauty of that because you can drive it along whilst you're up in the air, not right along the terrace, but just move along a bit for where you're cutting. And that terrace is the main entrance to the garden. So if there's people um, that can't get too far, it's easy to move out the way. Uh, we try to divert people. If someone really needs to use that path, it saves lifting all the outriggers up and uh, gets us through that. If you look at closely at that U tump, you'll see there's quite a lot of holes in it on that one and that's due to mouse damage um traditionally they've always been eaten by mice to be honest with you the mice live in there uh, we might take steps to discourage them but um they ring bark and further in and that's where he's cut dead wood out and it gets old so um uh, the edge clippers we use now the modern ones you have to have two hands on them because uh, the dead mice handle which obviously once have worked on ladders because we wouldn't have been able to them damn things so um we can use out that but these holes as they respond they, they always regenerate um they're obviously changing the shape as well and what i was getting at by using the uh, electric shears or they also with having two hands on you can't quite follow shapes as well so they're always evolving Sometimes if you get snow damage as well, uh, we get a snowfall, it might move some of the branches around. Uh, the wind can change them, but uh, that was particularly bad because um, it was after COVID and furlough when we didn't cut them for a year. And um, yeah, so we had to cut a lot out in one go where each year we tend to take a small amount out. As you can see, it's not just the views back to the castle that are fantastic. It's also the views out on the countryside. So when you enter the garden, you get these great landscape, all these spotted landscapes to look out on. This photograph of Dan Cutting here is a, kind of a favourite. He went on Facebook and had hundreds of thousands of views, I think about 300,000. And uh, one of the comments on there was, is he taking a golf shot? which I thought was fairly amusing. But you can see how wide the hedge is up on there. So uh, quite challenging and a long reach to do with. It's actually a petrol one, but we find it just has that bit more guts up there to deal with than the battery ones at the moment. We use the battery one, but um, the top obviously grows very strong being the top of the tree. And rumour has it that the family actually sat on top of that and had a picnic which is quite possible because you see that's um, the top of the trees, probably about four trees there that make that up or uh, it would be nice and firm. And that's similar to where the chap he was standing with his scythe and having a good old cut off that one. So what a fantastic view, eh? You can see it a bit in its glory there. So. Um, the garden, although it's such a, a huge garden, there's a chap there, one of the gardens, Neil, cutting the great lawn where the water garden was with a small Kubota G23, boxing it off. It's just, we struggle to get things in. The uh, big site, we've not the greatest of access, to be honest. So that's a hectare, that lawn is cutting. 
Um, if you look up, you can see the big hedge there and the cherry picker right on top of it there. That's ones we started ironing in now, as opposed to that yellow one. I say that's got 17 meter reach. We actually get a 23 meter in that we bring it in and we can go over the top and cut as well, get down a bit and uh, finish it off like that. So I'd like to end on this lovely evening shot of the photograph now. That's from an illuminated garden event that we used to do. So probably just to prove the point that the garden even looks beautiful of an evening, doesn't it? Eh? You can see a couple of the yew trees are quite thin there. There's one where you can see the light actually shines through it. So we might cut that one every couple of years to let it photosynthesize and um, grow a bit stronger. Or, uh, that's my talk about done. So thank you all for listening and sharing.